our God. He is, he is greater than any God. There is no other God. Father, we're grateful this morning that you are our God. That there is no God beside you. You created the heavens and the earth. You created us in your image. You are so worthy of all of our praise that you would consider us that you would know us, that you would redeem us as your own. Worthy is the lamb who was slain, whose blood that was shed. We thank you this morning. We pray, God, that your word would go forth, that you would teach, your son would be lifted up and exalted above all others, and that at the name of Jesus, every knee should bow and every tongue confess that he is Lord. In his name we do pray and ask it all. Amen. Amen. Praise God this morning. It is a blessing to uh, be before you and to have the opportunity to share God's word with you. And we pray this morning that um, indeed God would instruct us by his spirit and that after hearing his word, we would um, be changed, uh, that we would not be the same uh, as when we leave as when we came in. In fact, it begs the question, why did we come to church today? Was it, is it a weekly commitment that you get up, you get dressed, and you go to church? And, you know, some people call that my, um, um, uh, what do they call that? Ah, in those other religions, they... Ritual, you know, it just, I do it. Did you come to praise him and worship him? Uh, Or did you come to uh, see somebody and, why did you come? So hopefully, uh, by the time we're done, uh, the Lord will have clarified uh, in our hearts and minds Uh, why we are here this morning. We're going to continue, uh, in in fact, pick up in our uh, series in Ephesians. And in the time uh, remaining, try to do uh, an overview just to sort of bring us um, back together on the same page. And uh, you know that Ephesians was written by the Apostle Paul, Uh, that there are six chapters, uh, that the the book is broken into two parts. The first three chapters are doctrine, that is truth. Paul is telling us what we need to know uh, about ourselves, about God, about how he has blessed us uh, through his son, Jesus Christ. And then the second part is, is instruction, application for how to apply the principles, the doctrine, the truth that he has given us in the first three uh, chapters. And very quickly, I want to share with you that in chapter one, um, a lot of stuff is going on there, but two major themes. One, uh, the blessings in Christ that we have, um, and these we we gained even before the foundation of the world. Uh, Secondly, in uh, the balance of the chapter, Paul tells us uh, that he's praying for us and that he 
is praying for our spiritual wisdom and revelation in the knowledge of God. And this is an intimate uh, knowledge with God. And that he prays that our, the eyes of our heart would be enlightened uh, to understand God's calling upon our lives and God's power. Chapter 2, um, I, I like to refer to chapter 2 as the but God chapter. Because Paul talks about when we formerly, what we formerly were, and then he talks about what we were or what we are after God. And it's in chapter, in verse um, 4, where he says, But God, being rich in mercy because of his great love with which he loved us, even when we were dead in our transgressions, made us alive together with Christ. And so it's, but God. He goes on further in this chapter to tell us about the, the new humanity, the creation, where he took, uh, in verse 11, it says where he took the, those who were near, that is the Jews, and those who were far off, that is the Gentiles, and brought them together in one new humanity, which ultimately is the church of Christ. Amen. Then in chapter 3, he takes a little detour. After sort of telling us all of these things that we have, he then goes on to tell us that he was chosen to share the mystery of this, uh, this doctrine, this truth about the church, that the Gentiles from long ago, um, it was God's intent that they would be brought in and that he would love them and that he would make them his people. And Paul was, was given this ministry. Then in the latter part of chapter 3, verse 14 through 21, uh, Paul talks about and prays for believers uh, that they would know about their love of Christ and that we would understand this love in our inward parts. And, and like the song we just heard, it started off kind of low. And then it, it reached this crescendo. Our God is great. Paul does the same thing in these first three chapters. He tells us, he starts out and he's telling you, telling us what it is we have in God and in Christ. And he reaches this great crescendo of love in Christ. He uses it as a a platform to, to take off from uh, going into the, the focus of our, our lesson uh, today, which is in chapter 4, uh, verses 1 through 3. And I'm reading in the New American Standard Version, and it reads as such. I, therefore, the prisoner of the Lord, entreat you to walk in a manner worthy of of the calling with which you have been called, with all humility and gentleness, with patience, showing forbearance to one another in love, being diligent to preserve the unity of the Spirit in the bond of peace. And Father, again, we do thank you for your word and pray, God, that you will bless us, that you will teach us, that you will guide us, uh, that you will Love us so much that you will not allow us to remain as we are. It's in Christ's name that we do pray and ask it all. Amen. So when you read these verses, a question came to my mind is, what does God expect from us? Because he says there, I therefore, the prisoner of the Lord, entreat you, that is, I encourage you to walk in a manner worthy of the calling with which you have been called. So that, that says to me there's an expectation that God has for us, on us, to, work, to walk worthy of the calling with which you have been called. Next comment that comes runs through my mind is, well, doesn't God realize, though, that we're just humans? What, 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 what can he expect of us? 
We're frail. We get sick. We get mad. We're impatient. We're unloving, hateful, intolerant, jealous. Now, of course, I'm not talking about anybody in this room. We're lazy, procrastinators, me, chief of them all, prideful. And then we get, we have the nerve to say, I'm sick and tired of whatever else there is that we deal with. We make excuses. So now that I've described Christians, I'm now going to describe the world. I mean, that's interesting that Christians can fit into those descriptions easily. And yet God has this expectation of us. Doesn't he realize that we're just human? Paul seems to negate all of that in his words. Because he says in verse 1 of chapter 4, I, therefore, the prisoner of the Lord, entreat you to walk in a manner worthy of the calling with which you have been called. Paul, Paul negates all of the, the human stuff that we want to use as excuses for not walking the way God wants us to walk. But he helps us out. How does he help us out? He helps us out by throwing in the word, therefore. You see, the therefore takes you back to something before it. And the stuff before it, if we believe, if we have faith, will enable us to negate the human stuff that we so easily allow to beset us. So let's go back. Chapter 3, verse 14. For this reason, I bow my knees before the Father, from whom every family in heaven and on earth derives its name, that he would grant you according to the riches of his glory to be strengthened with power through his spirit in the inner man. So now, this is God's power through his spirit in us. So that Christ may dwell in your hearts. The dwell there means that Christ wants to come in and be at home. Not a stranger, not a visitor, but he, he's moving in. And everything else that is unlike him has got to move out. So that Christ may dwell in your hearts through faith and that you being rooted and grounded in love may be able to comprehend with all the saints what is the breadth, length, height, and depth, and to know the love of Christ, which surpasses knowledge, that you may be filled up to all the fullness of God. And then here comes the, the real zinger. Now to him who is able to do exceeding abundantly above, beyond all that we ask or think according to the power that works in us, to him be glory in the church and in Christ Jesus to all generations forever and ever. Amen. So, so if we follow Paul's therefore, we have no excuse for being human because he's telling us that within us, now wait a minute, there, there's, a, there's a prerequisite. A prerequisite is when you go to school, you want to take a course that is a really great course, but before you take that course, you have to take another course. That's a prerequisite. So in order for all of these things to apply, the prerequisite is you got to know him. See, if you don't know Christ, if he doesn't live in you, then none of this applies. Second prerequisite is you got to believe. You got to believe. And this is not 
a hoping believe. This is not I think believe. This is a believe that you can take to the bank. This is a believe that you can sit down on. When you came in this morning, every one of you, without a doubt, sat down on that bench, did not give it a second thought. You sat down. Now, if that bench had not been there, you would have been devastated, right? That's belief, to just sit down and know that it's okay. That's the prerequisite. What is the filled up in the fullness of God? How do, how, how do I get it? What, what does it mean? Well, the filled up and the fullness have to do with completeness and the way to envision it is like a balloon. When, when you blow air into a balloon, it gets filled up. And if it's a really good balloon, you can keep blowing and it just gets bigger and it just gets bigger and it just gets bigger. Well, that's what Paul is talking about here is that we get filled up with God. Now, how, do, how does this happen? First, you have to realize that Christ is God. Look at verse 19. It says, and to know the love of Christ, which surpasses knowledge, that you may be filled up to all the fullness of God. So how do you get Christ and God in the fullness? Well, when you have God, you have Christ. If you don't believe it, read the book of John. John declares throughout the book that Jesus is God. John 1.1. 1, 1. In the beginning was the Word. The Word was with God, and the Word was God. Is that true? Amen. You see, Paul is teaching doctrine, truth. He's not making this up. He, he's, he's telling us like it is. In John 10, 30, Christ says, I and the Father are what? One. John 17, 21 says, even as the Father are in me, I am in thee, the Father. Jesus is God. Turn over to Colossians just to make sure we get it. Look at uh, chapter 2, verse 8. It says, See to it that no one takes you captive through philosophy and empty deception, according to the tradition of men, according to the elementary principles of the world, rather than according to Christ. For in him, all the fullness of deity dwells in bodily form. And in him, you have been made complete. And he is the head over all rule and authority. Done. Jesus Christ is God. Not only that, but in him we are complete. The second thing we have to realize is that, and you have to believe this, is that Christ indwells us. Now right there in Ephesians, if you go back there, in chapter 3, 
Paul says in verse 16, praying to God that God would grant you, that he would grant you according to the riches of his glory to be strengthened with power through his spirit in the inner man. God indwells us. God indwells believers. So, if you believe that Jesus Christ, the Son of God, is God, if you believe that he indwells you, that he lives in you, then what is God expecting of us? And why can't we deliver on the expectations? Something for us to contemplate. You see, Christians, we, we live lackluster lives. We do. The reason I played that song this morning is I, I, earlier in the week I was praying to God and asking him, all right, Lord, what, what's the message this week? And every day this week I woke up with this song on my mind. Every day. And then all day long, our God. And I said, okay. All right, I, I get that, our God, but what, what, what does that mean, God? What, what's the point? Well, without our God, it's impossible to live like he wants us to live. It's impossible. When was it? Yesterday. Jehovah Witness came to my door. My first inclination was to, I looked out, I, you know how you pinch the, 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 what's the name of the blinders. And I looked out and, and I said, oh man. My first inclination was to let them think nobody's at home. And it, ding dong, ding dong. I had my grandson, so we're just sitting there eating some pancakes. Ding dong. And the Lord says, so what are you going to do? <laughs> Our God. So I said, all right, do I have any tracks in the house? I'm running around looking for the tracks. Found some tracks. I opened the door, and they are almost gone. <laughs> and so now I'm, I open the door, and I say, hello. <laughs> Come back! I didn't say come back, but that was the point. And they turned around. Come back. Good morning, brother. I said, good morning. So he comes up, and of course, he wants to give me the watchtower. And I'm going to take it. But now I got my track in, in my hand. I'm going to give him the track in exchange for the watchtower. I took the watchtower, handed out the track, and he said, oh, no, I can't take that. But it's good news. He said, I know, but I can't take that. So he said, aren't you happy about our Savior? I said, I sure am. His name is Jesus, and he is the Son of God. He said, yes, he is. I said, oh, but he is God. He said, well, I said, no, he is God. He, he wanted to leave then. And then, well, let me come back another time. I said, no, he is God. Don't you want this good news? Amen. Amen. What, what am I trying to say? Come on. Our what? is God. Amen. And his name is Jesus. And, and if we allow him, yeah. see, it's not us. If it's us, it's all of this humanity stuff. You don't have time. There's an excuse. I'm impatient. My pride. I got something to do. I don't have time. That's us. But if we allow our God <laughs> huh, to be in control in the inner man, then we are able. And then it's not us. It's him. 
Paul wants us to understand that. And so he continues to, to harp on this issue. Our God. Father, we thank you so much. God, we thank you for your word. God, we thank you for your patience. Oh, where would we be, Father, without you? Mm, mm, mm. Be lost. No hope. Believing a lie. And so I'm thankful this morning, Lord, that you have chose us and that we believe the truth. 